Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. I'm sitting with my best friend Tone. Oh man, thank God I'm back in the studio, back in the, man. Back in the studio, yeah, right? For first first interview out of quarantine, right? Oh my God, it's been over three months since I've been sitting in this chair, and it's crazy. Right? Uh, it feels good not only to be back in this chair, but you know, coming back to a guest today that uh, you know what I mean. Um, it's going to be an amazing, amazing podcast. It is going to be an amazing podcast, and I am beyond nervous about this podcast. Like, um. You know, uh, we, we normally talk to a bunch of uh, hairdressers and, and, and like-minded people, but we've never had like a Harvard graduate. We've never had a Columbia School of Journalism graduate, you know, like, and, and you know, we, we play podcasters on the weekend, but like she's an Emmy Award winning uh, a, a producer for, for actual real news, you know, not just a bunch of knuckleheads <laughs> right. deciding to crack a mic open, you know, so I am a little nervous, you know, both, uh, both. I mean, and there's just so much to her. Yeah, so. f- forgive us for our... Uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, for where we're about to put you through. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pre-apologize, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Okay, so I, I want to get right in, man. So uh, you're going to help me with the name because I, I mess it up every time. Alilia Bundles is on the podcast today. Um, and if you don't know who uh, Alilia is, um, she is legitimately one of the most amazing women that we've ever had on the podcast. And um, ha- where you may know um, from her of her is that uh, she actually wrote the book, um, that that the TV the Netflix TV show Self Made was made. Um, the the name of the book is On Your Own Ground, Ground and it's the life and times of Madam C J Walker. Um, who's it's C J Walker? Madam C J Walker is once again one of the most remarkable women. That, Sarah that Breedlove. <laughs> Sarah Breedlove. Yeah, we're getting into it. Um, so once again, if you haven't seen uh, Self Made on Netflix, it's it's on Netflix and it, it stars Octavia Spencer. And um, you know, we'll just we'll, we'll get into the conversation, shall we? Yeah, man. Let's, let's yeah, do it. They don't want to hear about from us anymore. Miss Olivia Bundles, welcome to your day off. Hey, so, you know, I have to say that I feel like I'm with my peeps because, you know, both of my parents were in the hair care industry when I was growing up. So we spent our um, vacations dependent on where the hair show was. So I, I'm very comfortable. Yeah. Oh no! My, yeah, that's what we, that's what we talked about. We we're like, you know, it's, you totally fit in. You are totally, <laughs> totally. You know what I mean? It, yeah, I mean, your yes, lineage uh, yeah, goes way so, back. Right. My my mom yeah. was vice president of the Madam C J Walker Manufacturing Company, which was founded by my great great grandmother, Madam C J Walker. And my dad worked for the Walker Company for a year or two after my parents were married. But then he became president of Summit Laboratories, which was one of the companies like Johnson Products and Soft Sheen that made chemical hair straighteners. So it was, I got it coming and going. And my real passion was writing. So I didn't follow into the family business. So I did have a couple, a couple of summers where I filed beauty supply order forms in my dad's office. <laughs> but I, But my real passion was writing. And so I ended up being a journalist and doing 30 years at NBC and ABC, but circling back and using those storytelling skills to write what's now four books about, about Madam Walker. And On Her Own Ground, The Life and Times of Madam C.J. Walker is the book that was the in Hollywood speak inspiration for <laughs> self made. Oh, oh, we're gonna get there. Means, <laughs> we're gonna it get there. Man. Wildly from the facts. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna get there. Hey, um, first of all, I just wanna. Uh, we are so incredibly proud that that we that we're the venue, right? That, that that's introducing you to to the to the uh, to the hair industry. So I don't know if you've done any other hair industry podcasts, but but certainly we're proud to have you on on our. You know, uh, podcast. some some beauty things, and I am the. Um, hair historian for the MCJW line of hair care products manufactured by Sundial Brands, which of course makes Shea Moisture and Nubian 
Heritage. So that company was founded by Richelieu Dennis, who acquired the trademark for Madam C.J. Walker. So I'm, I'm the hair historian. So I've done a couple of uh, Instagram live, but I have not done anything with salon owners and people who work in salon. So this is my introduction here, and I hope to do a lot more. Um, so thank you very much for, for reaching out. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, wow. um, so I think part of the reason that people are interested in Madam Walker is because of the Netflix series. So we said we'd spend just a little short period of time kind of going over what was true and what wasn't. Well, so there's a whole lot that's not true about <laughs> self -made. It's Hollywood, right? <laughs> it's Hollywood. It's Hollywood. But the thing that I do want to say is I, I loved Octavia Spencer in the role. I mean, I think that she really embodies Madam Walker's tenacity and gives you some sense of what it's like to build a business and the sacrifices and the triumphs. So I'm happy with her. Uh, and I love this, a few of the scenes where, for instance, she's in the market and she's trying to convince other women to become her sales agents. And I love the wigs. <laughs> I mean, the <laughs> wigs were great. And all of you, I know like me, all of you pay a lot of attention to hair when you see it in television and films. And a lot of times, especially Afro wigs are usually so whack that you just really can't stand it. <laughs> so this, this made me very happy. And it was um, Octavia Spencer's hairdresser, whose name is escaping me at the moment, but she is the one who did Octavia's hair. I, and so I just, I thought that was a real standout. I now loved I thing, loved all the hair and the clothes and stuff. That was like I no, loved going it? back and going to like a you know back to the 1900s. It was it was really great. Exactly, and, and then you can see how some of those some of those same hairstyles now you see on people today. So it's really kind of interesting to see all of the the beautiful sort of sculpted hairstyles that that people had then that are that are coming back because they were beautiful. They were kind of architectural feats <laughs> to create some of those hairstyles. Uh, but the but the film, the series, the limited series, as I say, inspired by my book. And what I really love for people to know about Madam Walker is that um, she's a woman who came from Delta, Louisiana, the poor, poor section of the South that had been devastated by the Civil War. And she was born on the same plantation where her parents had been enslaved and her older siblings. And then by the time she was seven, both of her parents had died. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when, you, when we show the slides, but she then transformed herself from a washerwoman after she began losing her hair into a successful entrepreneur who employed thousands of other women. So her story for me is a story of empowering other women. And then once she began to become wealthy she used that money as a political activist to support the anti-lynching movement. So she was kind of Black Lives Matter 1.0, <laughs> and she was a, a patron of the arts, and she uh, helped women become economically independent at a time when most of the jobs that Black women did were as maids or sharecroppers or laundresses. So I love to focus on that part of her story, her entrepreneurship, her philanthropy, her political activism, and this whole emphasis on the rivalry with Annie Malone, Addie Monroe, who's the character in the film, but Annie Malone was her real life rival. They were real rivals, but it wasn't about colorism and it wasn't that kind of petty cat fight thing. So I think the head writer just had a lack of imagination <laughs> and was uh, devolved into stereotypes. And so again, while I love what Octavia did, she had to work with the script that she had. So I'm happy to answer questions later, but I did okay. want to just uh, tell you what I think is important about Madam Walker versus, you know, what happened in the film. And I hope people will read my book. So, and or listen to the audio version that I taped in, um, that I taped earlier this year. Well, actually I listened to the audio book. Well, oh. same. I didn't, I didn't complete it, <laughs> you know, cause, cause uh, I got it last week and there, it was, 17 hours I think for the audiobook and I got I got about nine hours in so I'm, I'm, I'm about halfway through but uh but it's been for me 
it's been an incredible journey. I mean, not only just about her, but but just the way that that you've captured that entire early like 1900s and in that early time, and 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 just the the prominent people that were in and out of um you know the book and uh, Madam C J Walker. But we'll get into that. In yeah, because the way you wrote it, it just it, it just sucks you in. It, it's so fascinating, and it just really draws you into her story. And I'm actually a f as I'm reading it and listening to it, it's just like, it just, it's, it's an amazing experience. I mean, yeah. you wrote it so well. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you know, when I was reading the audio book, which, which was like eight days of reading, so, oh my <laughs> but goodness. it was, it was interesting for me because so much of it is still relevant. You know, many of the themes are still relevant, whether it's venture capital, whether it's business, whether it's, race whether it's politics i mean these are really very american things and so I'm, had, I'm glad that you are feeling sucked into it thank you uh, and look and, and, and you read it in eight days you're telling me you have you, you can't listen, in, listen to it in eight days there's something wrong there Touche. <laughs> well you know what I, i'm a big audiobook um lover too and it does take a while you have to sort of you know either you know we're not in the car as much as we used to be um, and I've, I've been, you know, now I have to say what well, I'm, I'm the sort of fulfillment shipping department when people want autographed books. So that's, <laughs> so I end up listening to books when I'm autographing and packing and getting ready to take things to the post office. So we find the time where we can. <laughs> that's it, man. That's exactly it. Yeah. I only have an hour each way, man. Oh, crazy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she was born, you said she was born in, 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 well, let you go through it. Okay, so now can so I should can people see the slide? Is everybody seeing the slide of Madam Walker? We we are. Okay, so all right. Now is everybody now seeing the next slide? Tell, raise hands if you are. Yep, we got it. Seeing this, okay, excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, so that first picture is a sort of very famous picture, actually taken by a Washington D.C. photographer, Addison Skurlock, and he was the African American. Um, photographer for whom everybody wanted to sit. I guess he'd be the, is it Annie Leibowitz, who's the, you know, who's the famous photographer? Yeah. I think I got her name slightly wrong. But anyway, everybody wanted to be, you know, everybody African-American wanted him to take their picture. So that became the iconic photo of her. And this is Madam Walker at the, her 1917 convention of her Walker sales agents, the first national convention of the agents and clearly what had to be one of the first conventions of women entrepreneurs in America. And I will say it was two years before Mary Kay was born. And Madam Walker, like Mary Kay, gave prizes to the women who sold the most products and who brought in the most new sales agents, but she also gave prizes to the women who had contributed the most to charity. That's so you amazing. can imagine these women from all over the United States, the Caribbean and Central America, many of whom had been sharecroppers who had been maids, who had been laundresses, a few school teachers who now were making their own independent income. And at, she knew that they were able to buy homes. They told her about being able to send their children to school, invest in real estate. So they were you know, making lives that they never dreamed possible. And she said to them in her keynote speech, I want you to understand that your first duty is to humanity. I want mm. others to look at us and realize that we care not just about ourselves, but about others. And at the end of the convention, the women sent a telegram to President Woodrow Wilson, urging him to support legislation to make lynching a federal crime. So, you know, we're still trying to get a federal <laughs> exactly. bill for lynching to be a federal crime. <laughs> Aaliyah, that, she did that. She was focused on that in 1917. And it happened right after the... Uh, East St. Louis riots when a few dozen African Americans were really slaughtered and it was big headlines. You know, it would have been the George Floyd event of the of that time. So Madam Walker helped sponsor at what was called the silent protest parade with 10,000 African Americans marching up Fifth Avenue silently mm. just to the muffle of drums. And then she and some Harlem leaders took a petition from New York to the White House to present to Woodrow Wilson. He somehow found a reason not to meet with them, <laughs> but, um, but they, were, they were there. So, 
you know, the more you, things change, the more they stay the same. You were saying the silent protest, and I got the chills kind of like when she was saying it, because I could kind of feel it. Like I could, I could feel the protest. The drums. Just being the drums, right? Yeah. Like it was pretty cool. Olivia, I'm going to take you back just, just, just a hair. Um, you brought up Mary Kay. Was, um, was Avon and Mary Kay, did they use, did they use kind of Madam C.J. Walker's, uh, I don't know what you'd call formula. it. Formula. Formula. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. formula to kind of when they move forward. Like, was she the first or, or, or did she master the, uh, the, the first to master the, uh, the uh, mar multi-level marketing? Um, yes, yeah, so, thing? you know, Avon was really founded as the California Perfume Company, I think in 1892. So it had been around. And there were, you know, the Fuller Brush Man. So the selling, the door-to-door -door selling and the direct sales, that kind of thing, that had been around before Madam Walker, but not so much in the Black community. And Annie Malone, her competitor, also had sales agents and schools around the country. But I think Madam Walker really took it to another level because she modeled part of what she was doing after an organization called the National Association of Colored Women. They were a national group founded in 1896 before the NAACP with chapters all over the United States. And she saw that these activist women and their ability to organize was an inspiration for her, as well as the black church, because there were churches all over the country. So she could see the power of creating networks. And I can't say that, you know, that Mary Kay, for instance, you know, modeled herself after Madam Walker, because by the time Mary Kay came along, the Walker company was really, you know, no longer a major player. Right. So that model existed, but Madam Walker took it to a new level, especially for African American women. She's amazing to me. Like we have, um, there's actually somebody listening in on the conversation named Daniel Mason Jones. And Daniel did a podcast with us and, and just a little, two seconds about Daniel. Daniel um, makes um, over a million dollars a year working behind his chair. And he has four assistants that work for him. And on his podcast, he said that um, what he's most proud of is not the million dollars a year, not that, but every year he gets the opportunity to make millionaire. He, need, he teaches four people a year how to be a millionaire. And, 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 and as I'm listening to you tell the, the, the story on, on the, uh, the audio book, immediately that story uh, came up because, you know, she's known as the first self-made female millionaire. But, but what she did was not be a millionaire. She enriched people's lives and she, enri she enriched or, or had the potential to enrich generations of, of, of these women. I, you know, that is so true. I'm so glad you picked up on that because she had been um, really inspired by other women who, so when she was still a poor washerwoman at going to St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church. It was some of the more middle-class women of the church who reached out to her. She was in the choir, you know, she's still a poor woman, but she could sing well enough to be in the choir. She volunteered for the Missionary Society. So she was being mentored by other women. And I think once she developed her hair care product, which, you know, just to sort of tell people what it was, a hundred some years ago when most Americans didn't have indoor plumbing, people didn't wash their hair very often. And as cosmetologists, you know what that means. It's like bad <laughs> scalp infections. So her real secret was developing an ointment like, you know, Vaseline base with sulfur in it and getting people to wash their hair more often. So once their scalps were clean, they applied the ointment with sulfur. The sulfur was a bit of a medicinal agent. Their hair grew back. So that was the key thing for her when women didn't have a lot of products directed towards them. So, but in the process, I think of healing their scalps, she began to heal their souls and their, mm. and develop confidence. And that confidence meant that she was not only selling hair care products, she was allowing the women to become economically independent. So you're absolutely right. It created generational wealth because people could be educated, they could own real estate, they could be leaders in their communities. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it's so mind blowing, you know, because it, you know, if you're telling that story in today's world, you know, you can see that. But back then, she not only, you know, coming out of a plantation and, 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 and making it happen as, as a black woman back then, but being a woman, period, right? Because even women back then, no matter what race, but women weren't necessarily an entrepreneur. They weren't, mm -hmm. you know, in business or, you know, they definitely didn't have the right to vote or anything like that. But it was just, it's 
so mind blowing that the obstacles that were in front of her and she was just able just to overcome and climb them and just push them aside. It, mm -hmm. It's so mind blowing. Yeah, you know, and you look at the faces of these women and you know there is a, a story behind each one, the struggles that they had to go through to get to where they were to some of them had been enslaved, some of them were children of formerly enslaved people, um, some of them had, had some of them were widows, but you knew, you know that each one of those women had some incredible story to tell. And the fact that they now were leaders in their community that you know, it, it really went on for generations. I have a good friend named Tiffany Gill, who's a professor at University of Delaware, and she's done a lot of research on hairdressers during the civil rights movement. So when places like Birmingham, when the churches became too uh, much of a target, the women own, who owned their beauty shops could have meetings and no one suspected it. And then some of those women through their organization, the National Beauty Culturist League, helped pay for the buses to send people to Washington for the March on Washington in 1963. Wow. So you see it really carried over that, they, that it wasn't being a hairdresser was being in leadership roles. Now, you know, when other people joke about, oh, the gossip that goes on in the beauty shop, well, yeah, there is some <laughs> of that. But you also know that you are uh, people that others come to, that you are counseling people that you are giving them information yeah well, i mean her brothers were barbers right when she joined them that's right so her brothers were barbers and but she, you know i don't have any evidence that she worked with them but i think that she was in, certainly introduced because you know the, the barbershop was very much a male space but she definitely began to learn something about hair care and about business from her brothers. And it really was at a time when black men dominated the barbering trade. So you would see that her brothers um, had their own business and that was often where the musicians would gather. That was where a lot of political conversation happened. So she, she was exposed to that through her brothers. That's amazing. I just she's so inspiring. What was her relationship like? And and during the um during in the book you 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 talk about uh, Booker T. Washington a lot. What what was her relationship with Booker T. Washington? And then I actually have a question about that. So so give me a sec uh, to, to to ask a follow up question. Sure, absolutely. So yeah, the Booker T. Washington. I mean, and that of course you know reminds me of how horribly he was portrayed in the film. <laughs> and I know some of his descendants, so I'm up, as upset for them as I am for me about the about the inaccuracies. But he, at, of course, was the most powerful black man in America at the time. And their relationship got off to a rocky start because she wasn't part of his inner circle, but she was determined that she was going to get his endorsement because she knew that it would make a difference. I guess it's like if you're a political um, figure and you need an endorsement to help you win an election. I mean, she saw this as a way to get the attention of, of other people. So she showed up on his uh, campus and asked to be included in uh, in the conference, and he really kind of dismissed her. And then she came to his 1912 National Negro Business League convention. By that time, people knew who she was. She was very prosperous. She had just contributed a thousand dollars to the building fund of the Black YMCA in Indianapolis. And so, when she sent word to be included on the program, he ignored her the first day. And on the second day, another friend of hers stood up and said, we should hear from her. Washington ignored him. And to make a long story short, she saw that he wasn't going to give her the opportunity to speak. So she decided she would take it. And she waited until the last banker completed his remarks. <laughs> and she stood at her seat and she said, surely you are not going to shut the door in my face. I'm a woman who came from the cotton fields of the South. From there, I was promoted to the wash tub. From there, I was promoted to the kitchen. And from there, I promoted myself into the business of manufacturing hair goods and preparations. And I have built my own factory on my own ground. Now, the next year he invited her back as a keynote speaker. <laughs> I bet he did. <laughs> and by the time he died in 1915, there was a mutual respect and she was giving money to his school um, for scholarships. And he spoke at 
a couple of times at he, he and at her at his conventions and at the dedication of the YMCA. So there's an arc to that story that you don't get from the series, and I think is a much more sort of satisfying and historically accurate arc to the story. It, it, it's amazing. I got the sense. Um, I got the sense uh, again listening to the book that, and, and I'm, I'm reading between the lines here, but, but correct me if I'm completely wrong, but um, because, she was, because she was orphaned at seven and, and didn't really have a fatherly figure, I kind of felt like she was looking to Booker T. Washington for, for, for fatherly validation. Like, like that's kind of what, it, and she kept kind of going back and she kept putting herself in a position to like, to get the, the proverbial door slammed in her face, but she, she, she just kept at it, kept at it, kept at it. And to me, it just kind of translated as, oh, she's looking for validation, not necessarily, I mean, I think she obviously wanted that, but that's it kind of felt an, more personal. You know, that's about. an interesting, um, that's an interesting way. I mean, she definitely wanted his validation. I think her brother served as, you know, served that role for her. Uh, you know, for that kind of fatherly figure because they were a great deal older than she was. But she definitely wanted that endorsement because as a person who had, you know, been very poor, who'd been on a cotton plantation, this first generation out of slavery, a washerwoman who everybody looked down on, she wanted to be taken seriously. So absolutely, she, she, wa she knew that if he paid attention and endorsed her that it would open other doors for her. In that role. I think one of the most impressive uh, things that, that I, you know, one of her quotes is that I got my start by giving myself a start. That, when, when I read that, it was just like something rang in my ears. Like, it, it, it was just so powerful. Yeah, it's like it's nothing standing in my way, right? Yeah. Or nothing did. Like, like. Well, I'm know, not gonna let owning it. I'm not gonna let Booker T. Washington close his conference so, without <laughs> me saying something. You know what I'm right. saying? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's almost like Black Lives Matter on 16th Street right. in view of the White House. <laughs> right. That's it. Actually, on you know, on that note, and, and um, again, listening to the book. She comes across, and, and certainly on the show, she comes across as this really proud, confident woman. But I know, like, moving, you know, just in everybody's life, once you start to, like, change, once you start to pass through, like, uh, like social classes, that, for me, that's always been, like, the most intimidating position to be in. So, did she, was there insecurity? Did she have to learn how to be confident? Or did she just, like, pick herself up by the proverbial bootstraps and just, like, you know what? I, I, I've got something to prove. And, or, you know, as a washerwoman, did she kind of have to earn that, that, that confidence? That's a, really, that's a really good question. So when I think about how she developed, she did have some mentors. But having those mentors was no guarantee that she was going, that the outcome was going to be what it was. But there was one woman in particular, um, Jessie Batts Robinson, who was a school teacher in St. Louis, who'd been one of her daughter, Alelia's school teachers, but who also was um, a member of the same church involved in the Might Missionary Society, and who was, an, she and her husband were national leaders in the Black version of the Knights of Pythia. So she was the I don't. I think it was called Executrix, which is kind of weird, but of the uh, the court of Calant. So I think she began to see that there were other women. You know, a lot of people. Most people didn't have any college degrees or a lot of education, and that your sheer will could move you forward. But I think she was, as she got some of those early mentoring lessons and modeling herself after some of these club women she then realized that there were other women who had been in the same position she was and just a little step ahead of them she knew that she could lift them up because she had been lifted up i love that man i it, it, you know what i mean in a time where you know it's not like i i can send a text or an email or nope. you know what i mean like talk to my mentor talk to somebody and get my answer like that i mean it's even more it makes it even more impressive Right. Yeah. Yeah. She, 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 she yeah I, you know, up. I know she would have been an Instagram girl. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> she, you know, and I said maybe I'll just go forward and show. I'm gonna s s s go through some slides. You see, this is her 
the advertising. So this is like made for Instagram, right? Yeah. <laughs> this before, is and before and after. Yeah. And she used that the power of images to sell her product. So you can see in the center, her hair is very short because she's been losing her hair. But she shows that her product really does work because now her hair has grown. And she also used testimonials in her advertisements where women would write to her and they would say that their hair had grown or they're now they were making money. One woman wrote to her and said, before I started using Madam Walker's wonderful hair grower, my hair was an eighth of an inch long and now my hair is down my back and I've been able to throw my wig away. And then another woman wrote to her and said, you have made it possible for a black woman to make more money in a day selling your products than she could in a month working in somebody's kitchen. So those mm -hmm. kinds of testimonials were very uh, effective. And then this is her wonderful hair grower. She put her own image on her, um, on her product, her vegetable shampoo. And then, she, you know, then the, another made for Instagram. <laughs> photo. When she, when she was, when she moved to Indianapolis and built her factory. Wow. That's so crazy. You know? It is crazy. And it's not like they had editing tools and stuff like that on Instagram, <laughs> right? Where they can uh, fake it. Unfiltered. Right, yeah. <laughs> Hashtag unfiltered. <laughs> <laughs> That's so incredible. So, I mean, I mean, once again, I mean, just we, we kind of jump forward a little bit, but like not only did she sell the product, but now she's building factories. And not, and not only was it her agents that were working for her, but now she's putting a whole community to, to work, you know, through the factories and then through, I mean, she had a, she had a business to run, right? So right. Um, it's not just the, uh, just the, just her agents. I, I'm just it's so well, blown you know, away. And I think one of the things when you say, cause it is the hair business um, <laughs> that, that what at, at the conventions, the which she taught the women about, um, you know, they had a little, book of sort of financial advice and a, a little ledger so they could keep track of their money. She encouraged them to save. She encouraged them to give. They had bylaws. So she was really trying to create infrastructure for the women. And then one of the reasons I think that contributed to her success, she had a great product. She said, that's the first thing you have to set, have, then you have to advertise it. And then you surround yourself with talented people. And I think that was part of the key to her success. She hired a great attorney. In the film, you know, F.B. Ransom just really kind of seems like a loyal deputy, but he in fact was a really strong presence for her. And because he was so devoted to the company and to um, protecting Madam Walker legally when she needed to be protected, to making sure the T's were crossed and the I's were dotted, because he was along with Alice Kelly, her, the manager of her factory, operating the day-to-day -day business in Indianapolis, that allowed her to travel and to be a visionary and then to expand what she was doing in, in addition to building the business, but to using the platform that she had as a political activist and as a philanthropist. But that ability to surround herself with strong people was part of the reason her business was successful. It, there's a story that you tell in the book about um about FB Rand Rand Ransom Random Ransom Ransom, Ransom, mm -hmm. Ransom that uh she kind of met him as a waiter or something right like wasn't he like working his way through school and like she must have had this amazing eye to put the right people in the right positions because you know once again we're talking about a woman that's not educated I mean I think I think she said that you know she has three months of like a formal education but you know she continued to educate through her entire life but she did it with the people that she put in place. Yeah, definitely. And I think part of that was, again, seeing these, fo these folks at church and she could, she learned a lot from them. She did go to, she said, went to night school at, after her daughter started going to school. She really wanted to uh, expand her, her learning. And F.B. Ransom was, had gone to college and then he was studying law at Columbia uh, in New York. And he was, as many African-American um, college students did, and then beyond college, worked as Pullman Porters or worked on the railroad. And so she seems to have met him in that capacity. In this picture, you see the Madam Walker, of course, is driving and the woman right behind her is Alice Kelly, who became the manager of her factory. But before that, Alice Kelly was Dean of Girls at a black boarding school in Kentucky. Mm. So she knew not only could Alice Kelly in some ways be a private tutor for her as she continued to learn, 
but also had the ability to work with young women and to, to manage them. I'll just tell you two quick things about sort of her lifelong learning. There's a letter that F.B. Ransom wrote to Madam Walker when she was traveling, and he said, the next time you're at home in Indianapolis, we have to go to the bank because your handwriting has improved so much that the bank is not sure it's your signature when you write those big checks. No way. <laughs> and then her secretary, uh, Violet Davis, who started working for the company as a teenager in 1914 and was still working for the company in the late 1970s. And so wow. she was one of my key sources of information. But she said that when Madam Walker was in Indianapolis at the office, she would, all of the girls in the office, the office girls, of course, just wanted to be in the same room with her. So they would read the newspaper together in the morning. And if somebody didn't understand a word, they looked the word up together. Nobody made fun of somebody for not knowing something. It was, how do we help you move mm. forward? That's well, beautiful. That is beautiful. So, so let's, let's take it back. I mean, you're in a time where, you know, uh, men are the primary breadwinner, right? I mean, that's, that's got it. She's making all these women successful. And obviously she's making uh, uh, a, a, a ton more than the average person. Uh, she's making in a week than they do in a month. But do, were men afraid of her? I mean, how, like, and were men and the women that she's making successful, were their husband, I mean, was it acceptable? I mean, how did, how did the men react to this? You know, I think probably the whole range of things, you know, there were some people who, you know, who still thought women should be at home. But I think that the economics of the African-American community is that men were underemployed. They couldn't get jobs and women could kind of work in that safe space where they were basically doing work, interacting with other women. And so they could make their make their money. But there were there were a lot of women who were outspoken and who were leaders in their community so i think you know the guys who could keep up kept up <laughs> and the ones who couldn't didn't <laughs> beautiful i love right. it how was in the tv show and, and I, I promise not to go to the tv show but 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 okay. I, I can't i can't help it um what what was cj walker like her husband what was their relationship and and and, and how did that really play out yes yeah, so um you know, I, I, actually, I, I just saw a couple of questions and I want to make sure that I remember to mention something. So you have to excuse yeah, yeah. my old brain. <laughs> if I didn't write it down, I wouldn't remember it. But so CJ Walker, I think that when their relationship started, they were a good match for each other. She, the, her first husband, Moses McWilliams, had died and we don't know how you know sometimes you'll see that he was lynched but there's no basis for that for knowing that and then her second husband john davis was just kind of you know one of those rebound <laughs> relationships it was it, he was not a good guy but she just it, she was really poor and struggling so by the time cj came along she already was moving herself to the next level and i think that he in selling newspaper ads and knowing something about newspapers, I think he was somebody she really met through her good friend, Jesse Batts Robinson, whose husband was the publisher of a black newspaper in St. Louis. So he looked like he was going to be, you know, like they were going to be able to do something together to collaborate. And she already was, had her mind made up that she was moving to the next level and this would be a good partnership. So in reality, there in St. Louis, she moved to Denver ahead of him, selling Malone's products at that point. She had a sister, her widowed sister-in-law and four nieces were living in Denver. She quickly joined the AME church and then CJ moved to Denver with her. And amazingly in the black newspaper in Denver, you could see he had ads, he had a real estate company, he would do events and she would do the hair, he would do beauty contests and picnics and you know he was kind of an impresario so i think that they were both kind of on this path of like we're gonna hustle and we're gonna get things done but then there became a point where her ambition outstripped his where she could see that she really could grow this company beyond just enough and he was kind of getting satisfied with with just enough 
So I think that, you know, that happens in relationships. Sometimes one person wants to move a little faster, or a little farther than the other person. But I think it started out, you know, fine. And I, and I have to say, I, I was really happy to see Blair Underwood as Octavia Spencer's love interest. <laughs> And I, and I very much appreciated him because he reached out to me to do extra research. He really wanted to know as oh, much wow. as he could about, about C.J. Walker. That's pretty amazing. We have so many questions, but I also, uh, you know, we promised a Q&A, so I want to make sure that we get to other people's questions. Uh, Katie, if, uh, if you're in the room, um, can you kind of help us out uh, finding uh, some questions? Yeah. I have, um, I have them all saved for you guys. These are some great questions. Really good questions, yeah. If, we, if, if you can save them uh, afterwards, and if I can't answer everything, I would be happy to. Yeah, I have them all saved separately, but then great. I don't know, can you guys see through the chats? Uh, well, I, we can't see the chats, but uh, but okay. just give us a question that we can bring somebody um, on uh, so they can, uh, I'll unmute just them. Give us the name. Yeah, just give us a name and we'll, uh, we'll go. Um, okay, so let me just scroll back to the top. Okay. So while you're doing that, I'm just going to mention a couple of things. I saw somebody mentioned a documentary. So there is a great documentary called $2 and a Dream that was done by Stanley Nelson, who's a well-known documentary filmmaker. And his grandfather was F.B. Ransom. So Stanley's very first film in 1981 was $2 and a Dream. And you can just Google that on YouTube and you can watch the full uh, hour. It, it's, it's really good. It will give you some great background. And then my websites are aleliabundles.com and madamcjwalker.com. And you can sign up for my newsletter. Hey, are the CJ, uh, are, the, are the Madam CJ Walker Instagram accounts or any of those yours as well? Yeah, so the MC, MCJW, uh, MCJW Beauty Culture, is our product line so it's right now in sephora but i but they're they're getting ready there's some announcements i can't really talk about quite yet but there are some good <laughs> changes getting ready to go <laughs> that's awesome katie who are we going to uh crystal you see her on there hello hello um Hi. my name Hi, is, hello um well my name is crystal um, I am a hairstylist owner. Um, I do all hair. I'm in Columbia, Missouri. Um, my Instagram is crystal hair and makeup and that's C-H-R-Y-S-T-A-L hair and makeup spelled out. Um, so I have studied a lot about the subject. Um, so I'm happy you really cleared up a lot of the, the things on Netflix. But one of the big questions um, is I know that Madam C.J. Walker Beauty Couture actually never closed um, can you share uh, more about the company's journey and the current partnership with philanthropist um, Richard Lou Dennis? Yeah, absolutely. I saw your question. I'm so glad you asked about that. So the Madam C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company was founded in 1906, and it was a major player um, until the 19, into the 1950s, along with Poro and um, Sarah Spencer Washington's Apex Company. Those were the big three Black women-owned companies. But just like we see the industry being disrupted in many ways, those companies, that model was disrupted by Summit Labs and Johnson Products and Soft Sheen with the chemical straighteners. And then the ownership of those companies began to change as L'Oreal and Revlon and Alberto Culver bought some of the black hair care lines. Then we went, you know, the Afro happened and weaves and back and forth and back and forth. So the business is really different from when Madam Walker started. But my family and F.B. Ransom's um, children were involved in the ownership of the Madam C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company until the mid 80s. And the trademark was sold to another company which owned it for about 30 years, never really became a major player. And then much to my pleasure, Richelieu Dennis bought the trademark about eight, nine years ago. And Rich, uh, for those of you who don't know about Rich Lou, Rich is from Liberia originally, came to the United States to go to college. And when he graduated in 1991, his mom came on the last plane out of Liberia during the war, they couldn't go back. And so he started what, sun, what has become Sundial Brands, selling his grandmother's shea mm -hmm. butter recipe at the corner of 125th and 5th Avenue. 
and developed these lines. He was interested in Madam Walker because he'd heard of her in Liberia. And then he began to develop this line. And Rich sold um, Sundial to Unilever about two years ago. But from that bought Essence Magazine, created a $100 million venture capital fund for women of color entrepreneurs, uh, is a great philanthropist, and then created a foundation that now owns Madam Walker's home in Irvington, New York. So Rich, for me, is the embodiment of what a Madam Walker would be doing today if she were still alive. Awesome. Thank you. Katie, where are we going? You are going to Stephanie Luster. Stephanie Luster, please unmute and introduce yourself. Hi, I am Stephanie Luster. I'm president of Estations Incorporated. We have a manufacturing facility here in the Chicagoland area. And so my Instagram is Stephanie J. Luster. Um, same on Facebook and everywhere else as well. And so, uh, as I said, I have a manufacturing facility and I am a, of a family of legacy too. And yes. my question yeah. is, yes. So my question is more so on the strongholds because it feels to me like in historical it's been the same where um, when you go to the leadership in the beauty industry, even though, you know, over 80% of hairstylists are, are women, but when you go up towards the leadership and you go into uh, exposure and um, where your brands are being seen at, that's more male dominated. And so I have struggled at times with being able to fit into the men's group. <laughs> and I know that even with, uh, with Madam CJ Walker, she has to deal with it more so than what I do right now today, of course, but I want to know if there are any tips of things that she can do that I might even be able to incorporate into my business now that would help me be able to deal with that sense of sexism that's still around today of a woman or a female manufacturer dealing with the big boys club. Ah, <laughs> but you, I mean, you're so right that she, uh, she experienced that. And it is really interesting that once it became clear that the business was profitable, a lot of men now wanted to be interested because they'd kind of dismissed hair care and cosmetics as something you know, frivolous. But once it started making money, they wanted to be playing. I'm really glad that you are uh, in a leadership role with your family legacy company because when I saw your name, I'm like, oh, I, I, I know that name from the American Health and Beauty Aids Institute. And uh, I know my dad knew your, knew your family. But I, you know, the only thing I can say is that you just have to expose it. I think we're in a moment right now, not just with what's happening with policing and Black Lives Matter, but what's happening at Refinery29 and what's happening with Condé Nast, where people are speaking out and really calling out um, the way that they that women are being treated. And I, and even for me, with the with the Netflix series. Um, experience. Again, really glad that Madam Walker's name is now well known, but I think that um, I had to speak out about what I thought was not right. And I think a lot of people are often afraid to speak up because they are afraid, afraid of the repercussions and afraid of the consequences. And I'm just at a stage in my life where like, what are you going to do? You can't fire me because, you know, I'm going to say the truth. And I think you just have to walk in your truth. I know it's easier said than done, but, um, and, and have allies who are going to be with you. Make sure that they're not just, you know, other women who are going to be in your corner, but other men who are allies when you decide that you're going to come forward. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Next, we're going to go to, um, Stephanetta. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Ms. Bundles. We are honored to have you on here. Thank you My so pleasure. much. Um, I'm Stefanetta. I am a digital media director for Hype Hair Magazine and founder of Sedaya Black Beauty Guide, which is a Black-owned beauty directory. My Instagram is at Afrocken, A-F-R-O-C-K-I-N. Um, Madam Walker is a, a, pretty much a Black beauty legend for us <laughs> in terms of our entrepreneurship, philanthropy, ownership, everything related to, to Black beauty greatness. Um, but we still are facing some of the same issues in terms of visibility, underrepresentation, um, access to resources. You know, we're the least funded still. Uh, what advice would you have for this new generation of entrepreneurs who are looking to make their mark? 
So, you know, one of the things that I um, really like about what Richelieu Dennis is doing is this, the New Voices Fund. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, uh, but you can Google New Voices Fund. And there's another organization called Eureka, U-R-E-E-K-A, um, a, a venture capital fund that is founded by Melissa Bradley, who had who was working with New Voices, but who's worked in the White House and Small Business Administration. But I would say some of that networking with the venture capital groups that are giving education, that are helping people navigate these spaces is really important. And, and Eureka, U-R-E-E-K-A, Melissa Bradley, Google her. And I, you will see that part of what they do is pair people with mentors. And while you may be you know, already in charge and doing that, it's always helpful to have somebody who's a few steps beyond where you are who can help you figure out how to navigate. And I, I think that um, some of the ways that I navigate, there's a, something going on in, in my industry right now the, at ABC. So I worked at ABC, NBC and ABC for 30 years. And just this past weekend, there was a big article on, I think, Huffington Post about one of the executives who has been put on administrative leave because of some of the horrible, you know, just racist, sexist, horrible things that she said about others. And she's, she actually was in a job that I was in for a while. And I have watched how she's been called out, but I knew how to, I learned how to navigate some of those spaces. And sometimes I wanted to speak up more than I did. And I didn't always speak up, but I don't, I think people are not, are tired. They're speaking up now. I feel like that segues into um, Ginger's question pretty well. Ginger? Hi. Um, my name is Ginger. My Instagram is Dope Curls by Ginger. I do, I'm a hairstylist in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I only work on tight curls. Um, so we know that black hair has been really political since 400 years ago. And Right now, even in the pro beauty industry, we're really having kind of a reckoning almost because of everything. What do you think the role of black hair is right now in this climate, in the Black Lives Matter era, as opposed to you know the 60s when it was Afros? What, what do you think our hair does and what role is it playing right now? Yeah, so I mean, I really, the Crown Act is just huge. Um, to be able to see that. So I don't know, I, I really don't know what the organization is that if there, what there is on a national level where people are able to come together. For instance, the National Beauty Culturist League was founded in 1919. And I love those folks who are, who are part of that organization, but they are really you know, much, much older and not technologically savvy. And so they're not really the, not playing the same role though for a while, they were key. They were, as I say, going to the March on Washington. Um, Martin Luther King always spoke at their conventions because he knew that the hairdressers could organize, that they had other people's ears. So I don't know what the equivalent of that is now. And if there isn't something, then you need to create it and pull together with the folks who are here because you do have power. You see how much people wanted to get back to the salon that this is something that's essential in their lives and you can leverage that um, for all kinds, you know, whether it's vote, registering people to vote or whether it's making people aware of what's going on in the communities and, and speaking up. But for hair just itself, it is really interesting for me to watch this, this hair journey because I am, you know, I'm 68 years old, which means I have seen a big hair journey from when I was a senior in high school and wanted to have an Afro, but my father was president of a company that made chemical hair straighteners. So he was not really on board with that. Though my mother, at, who was at the Walker Company at the time, uh, realized that you know hair, I was expressing myself, I was expressing my politics, and she took me to the Walker Beauty School to uh, have the students roll my hair up on permanent wave rods so I could, my permed hair could become an Afro. And then my hair eventually grew out. Um, but at that point, that was just like, it went from zero to a hundred where people stopped pressing their hair and they stopped using chemical straighteners and 
we have afros but you have you sort of had two options it was you know a teeny weeny afro or a big angela davis you know pam greer afro but now and then we the pendulum has gone back and forth and i think people were really intimidated there were lawsuits about as you know about you can't wear your hair natural it's un, it's unprofessional but i don't think people are going for that anymore and part of it is you know people like carol's daughter and richelieu and um thank god i'm natural you know all of the companies and youtube and people speaking out and the fact that there are products that allow us to have much more versatility so i love that you can see everything from twists to locks you know the whole range and people feel confident about their hair and now it is backed up by legislation that makes it illegal to discriminate against people that doesn't mean that people aren't going to be pressured in their environments in their work environments and that they're not going to be harassed about it. And so we have to back that up with, um, you know, with, with the legal, with legal um, support. Thank you. Okay, uh, Vanessa Rose. Hi guys, can you hear me? Hi. Um, Ms. Bundles, thank you so much for this opportunity and to meet you, I'm so excited. This My pleasure. Cool. Um, as beauty professionals, I believe that we have a responsibility to be leaders in our community for social justice. And salons and beauty shops have long been a safe space throughout history for us. And as inclusive as we are as a people in the beauty industry as a whole, we still remain largely separated, black salons, black barber shops, white salons, white barber shops. For those of us who do have black employees and white employees who are able to do black hair, what could we do as salon owners to uh, bridge the divide and, and create more of a diverse population coming into our spaces? Well, that's a really good question. I think everybody is grappling with this right now. You know, what to say, what's appropriate to say, how, you know, how not to make people uncomfortable, but at the same time, how to listen. So there are all kinds of, you know, reading lists, movies, <laughs> things that people are trying to do together to hear each other. And I, I don't, it's not easy because if it were, if it were easy, we would not be having the problems that we're having right now. But I will, you know, I will send Corey uh, and Tony a list of some of the things that I've seen about, you know, reading lists or movies. You know, though I, I did see Netflix has created, I don't know, 30 movies for Black Lives, hashtag Black Lives Matter, which is kind of whack in a way, you know. And, they're, you know, the help is number one. And the help is like not really the movie that is going to give you much enlightenment. It, it, it kind of glosses over things. So sometimes some of the, the documentaries are, you know, more helpful to really understanding. And it, and it is a moment where I think people's minds are opened. I just think that these, these videos, this police brutality has, I, I, don't, I guess I don't understand why people didn't get it before, but now, but now people are like, wait, why is it that we are going through this? Why, you know, why did we not know it? Why are not, not, we not paying attention? So I just think there's, there's a whole education that has to happen when the kinds of things that I write about in On Her Own Ground are the sort of the history of African Americans from the Civil War through World War I and things like the Tulsa riot. I don't know how many of you saw 60 Minutes last night. But you know, most Americans don't know that story. But there are all these kinds of stories that help people, I think, understand why there is so much concern. But I will, I'll send a reading list to uh, to Corey, and some documentaries, some of Stanley's Stanley Nelson's documentary, Boss: The History of Black Business, The Black Experience in Business, is another one that might be useful. And then maybe you know, you watch it and have a discussion. And, and say, this is one thing I really want you to watch. Here's something I really need you to watch. Thank you. Okay, Monet.
Sorry. Uh, hello, Ms. Bundles. I am so happy to be on here with you today. It, you are absolute royalty. I'm Monet Everett. I'm a celebrity hairstylist as well as uh, educator and public speaker. And many of my questions have already been asked. So I will go with how would you yourself um, and um, Mrs. Walker feel like what would be the focus today that she would recommend collaboration or cooperation? I'm sorry, collaboration or competition? Yeah, you know, I'm so I'm so sorry that 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 the Netflix series really kind of went in on this kind of cat fight between two women. It just really the colorism part wasn't accurate. Um, they were rivals, but they were you know the the world was big enough for two people to exist in and and to have you know slightly different ways of doing things. So, you know, Madam Walker actually. Uh, formed a national black manufacturers association to try as a consortium for the other black owned uh, hair care companies. And Annie Malone did not join that group, but there were a number of other black owned companies and Madam Walker wanted them to be able to sh pool their resources and to, they knew that there were a lot of people trying to take over their companies and she wanted to create kind of a bulwark against that. So I think there are there are ways to to collaborate. And obviously people have companies and they want their company to be the one that gets the customers and you know that that sells the product or comes with up with the new formula. But I think there is some strength in in collaboration in a kind of umbrella organization. That's right. Thank you so much. Okay, Amy D. Sorry, I was, I didn't know I had to mute myself. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you so much. I'm Amy Dawes. I'm with Beauty Launchpad Magazine, and I am so honored to speak with you. So thank you so much for your time. Um, Madam C.J. Walker, as we know, was, was not just the first self-made female millionaire. She was the first self-made millionaire, period. And in a time now where we have somebody on track to perhaps become the first trillionaire, in a global pandemic. There is an argument that to be a, that kind of entrepreneur, to be exceedingly, exceedingly wealthy and exceedingly um, successful, you have to be ruthless. You can't be altruistic. What do you think Madam C.J. Walker would say to that argument, given the fact that she, it, it appeared that she was collaborative, she empowered people around her to not only improve their own position in life, but also improve other people's positions by donating and um, giving back. Yeah, you know, the, the philanthropy and the collaboration is key to her success. So yeah, I, I think, you know, ruthless comes back to bite you. And I think, you know, and you're remembered for being ruthless, but she is remembered for creating generational wealth and for giving back to her community. And she was stronger because she empowered other people. So I, I absolutely think this is the best way to be, that she was, she was looking at ways that she was going to enrich the lives of others, that this idea for creating a national organization and hosting a national convention was to be able to give women support, as opposed to just everybody go for themselves. So it's, I think it's very important. Uh, you know, and I'm just thinking of people, you know, this giving circle Truly, obviously, Warren Buffett has made a lot of money, and Bill Gates has made a lot of money. Uh, David Rubenstein has made a lot of money, but they have pledged that they're basically their children are going to get something. But it's not about trying to, you know, perpetuate this wealth into the next generation. It's what are you giving back, you know, to your community and to the world. Thank you. Okay, the retail boss. Hello, hello, greetings, Ms. Spundles and everyone Hi. here on the panel. I'm just, first of all, I'm at a loss for words. I'm super nervous with my question right now. You can feel my- I energy. am so glad to meet you. <laughs> Thank you so, so, so much. 
much. Um, my name is Sakina Merriweather, and I go on Instagram by the name of I Am The Retail Boss, which I also host a podcast, and I teach uh, future professionals and beauty industry professionals um, retail sales and business. So, of course, you already know where I'm going with this question. <laughs> there is, is so many um, avenues that we can go as hairdressers and as barbers. And I found myself early on in my career understanding by the leadership of uh, Mr. Joe L. Dudley Sr. of understanding retailing and how it can actually build wealth and get me from behind the chair. And I was able to successfully, successfully do that at the age of 40. And my quest now is to teach others how to be able to do the same thing. The problem that I face is when I go into the beauty schools to bring this education and when I am um, on the road and I'm educating, I find it's very hard to get people in my industry, doesn't matter what color it is, people in my industry to, to see the, the wealth that they can build for their families and for generations to come through retailing, even if you don't even own your own company. Mm -hmm. And I just want to know what advice that you can give me as well as other educators that also teach salon business and retailing. What advice can you give me to push forward with that message of building business wealth within our community as cosmetologists in this industry? Yeah, you know, and it is, sometimes it really is hard for to get people inspired for them to see their own potential. That, I think that's part of the reason that one of the scenes that I loved in Self Made was Madam Walker in the market saying to women, try this. And you could see it took a lot of persuasion. And she faced that. Because, and I remember there's, you know, among one of the things she was trying to give people, she was essentially fronting people money to open a beauty salon in different cities. And one of the women who she was trying to set up wanted a salary. And she said, no, I'm going to give you all the, you know, the, I'm going to pay one month's rent and I'm going to give you all the equipment, but everything that you make is how much you make. I don't want to give you a salary. That's not the point. And the woman didn't quite grasp that. I, I know that among the things that Madam Walker did is she traveled around the United States. She would first give a lecture in a church to the whole congregation and she would say she showed slides kind of like a um an early version of powerpoint on a stereopticon and she got people excited about the message about current events and about business and about education and then she would once people were excited she would meet with 10 or 12 women separately and demonstrate her product and she as she was talking she would see who asked the best question who did others gravitate towards um, who seemed to who seemed to be curious, and she would make that person her lead agent for the town. So sometimes it is about who your leaders are, who can help give that message, who can help spread that message, so that you have partners, so you're not having to do it all your own. But you are right that sometimes it's really hard to convince people that they can do something on their own, that they have the potential. Awesome. Am I live? Hello, hello. Hey, welcome back. Hey, uh, dude, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everybody in the room for those questions. I mean, they were just, they were really, really great questions. We have one more question that actually was texted in. So uh, after that, uh, we'll, we'll get all wrapped up. But um, what should white hairstylists know about fighting against texturism for the industry? Um, you know, talk to your, talk to your friends who are doing hair. One of the things that I will tell you is that I have no hair skills. <laughs> Here's my hairdo. I am a wash and wear girl, um, and I I admire people who um, who know what they're doing. I have three or four textures going on in my hair, uh, in my head, and you know I find something that's really easy. But I really admire the people who have really studied it, studied it, and who are artists. Um, so I would say, you know, and somebody was telling me that. You know, that, that black hair is not taught in a lot of schools now. That's mm -hmm. just crazy to me that people aren't learning it. I, was, I got something, an, an, a message from somebody on Instagram who's in Washington State, and she wants to teach people about 
textured hair and there's she can't teach it in the schools there's no requirement it needs to be a requirement when in this period of time when it's not a requirement um there right now we can do all kinds of things on zoom and all kinds of classes and so somebody need, you know somebody who's on this call needs to say i'm going to start this and the class is going to be 50 dollars <laughs> or whatever it may be and begin to give people some some education because you can't learn it if you're not taught it and then you have to do it you have to do it in person so there are there are demonstrations there are classes and and the other thing i will just say is that for you know for, at least for me and the people i know all of us have several different textures going on in our heads and each person is different from the next person and i'll tell you this quick story i was doing a little um i did a little booklet for young girls and making them feel good about their hair and we were talking to mothers the mocha moms brought their daughters to the library we read together and i would see a mom walk in with three daughters and everybody's hair was perfect and then I'd see another mom walk in and her daughter's hair, you knew, really needed attention. And one of the revelations for me at that point was that our hair is an expression of all of our ancestors. And even as a Black woman, if you figure out what to do with your hair, you may not know what to do with your daughter's hair because her hair is also her father's genes coming through. So our hair needs a lot of attention and it needs uh, understanding. So we have to teach each other. But the curriculum needs to include this. You, you know what? We actually have somebody that, uh, that, 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 that wants to ask you a question if you have time for just one more. Um, and she's kind of an expert on this whole thing. So I think the uh, segue is perfect. So uh, Ms. Kia Neal, if you're in the room, please unmute and introduce yourself. Ms. Bundle. Hi, Kia. <laughs> Tell her. <laughs> I could cry and I don't cry, but listen, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much for even doing this um, with your day off. Thank you guys for inviting us to the room. And, you know, I had a question, but I feel like this is a great pivot to what you were speaking to just now, because I am a stylist, but I'm a color educator, but I'm also the founder of a texture versus race movement that is doing exactly what you're talking about, which is empowering people with uh, safe spaces and exposure to all textures. And we're working very hard to standardize uh, texture education in all of the schools, whether they're private or um, state owned. And we are really working hard on our side to collaboratively create education and curriculums for people to come and learn. So we have summits where you know, black people learn to do white hair, and I'm just summarizing, and white people learn how to do black hair, summarizing. And it's just amazing that we're still here during this time, and we're having to do this. So just know that we're fighting on. <laughs> we are fighting a good fight on this side. And I think that in this time, this is my question, during this time, immediately now we see so much interest in texture hair. And we see so much uh, now is this great opening for us to do it. But my question would be, do you think that during this time that Madam Walker would be for, in, would be for diversity and inclusion? Would she have already been diverse by now? Do you think that, and I know this is kind of a guessing, but where do you think she would stand in on this? Because some black people say, uh, we don't need to be involved at this point. Let's just do our own thing and don't worry about, you know, white people. And then you have some black people are like, no, let's, let's diversify. Let's create a new, a new existence. Let's fix a broken system. Where do you think Madam CJ Walker would have been? Where do you think she would have sat in on this? Would she have been empowering the black movement or do you think she would have wanted to uh, embrace the diversity in, in inclusion methods now? Yeah, you know, I think that, you know, I think that what I see Richelieu Dennis doing is probably where Madam Walker would be because you don't, you know, you, you cannot build a business if you close yourself. <laughs> that you have to be part of the larger world, that part of the reason Richelieu sold 
sundial to Unilever is that he was starting to try to create an international infrastructure in Africa. And he realized that it would take him a decade to do what they already had, that it was a platform. But he set up something different so that he was still involved, so that he could use some of that money to buy Essence, a, you know, a Black media company, that he could use some of the proceeds from that sale to empower other women to create, to do venture capital investment. So I think it is, it, it, it is about trying to expand. And if, you, if what you want is to stay mom and pop and do something on your kitchen stove or just you know, have a limited um, reach, then you can stay to yourself. But if you really wanna have an impact on the world, it is about expanding. And your market for for you know for Richelieu and Sundial, he wants to sell uh, Nubian heritage lotion and soap to everybody. Everybody uses lotion and soap. Your the the products and everybody has a, well not everybody but many people who aren't of African descent have frizzy hair. <laughs> so there are other people who might like some formulation of the product. So I think you can, you know, some people may make a decision to stay in that lane. But I think that to, if you wanna have a big impact, it is about expanding and being open, staying true to your core by all means, but seeing the bigger world. Thank you. Wow. So Corey? Yes, ma'am. So I have, um, if you could, would you give me three minutes to just quickly go through the slides? I'm not even going to say yeah, much about yeah, that. Yeah, by all means. But I just want people to see these photos. Um, so this is Madam Walker and Booker T. Washington at the, when he said good things about her at the convention. Here she is with her um, team of salespeople in front of her factory. With some of her agents, when she traveled around the country, these are women who we're now making their own money. She's driving her electric car. Tesla. It's because she was ahead of the times, <laughs> always a technologically ahead of the times. She advertised and had customers all over the United States, the Caribbean and Central America. Here she is with her daughter in their chauffeur-driven car in Indianapolis. This is Lelia, who was nothing like Tiffany Haddish. <laughs> and I'm almost <laughs> finished with a new book about her, which will be out um, next year called The Joy Goddess of Harlem. This is the house that Lelia bought in uh, on 136th Street, which became the downstairs was the salon and upstairs the living quarters. And that's another reason why Madam Walker is still remember because her daughter persuaded her that they should be in New York. And then they redesigned that small townhouse into a double townhouse with a salon, as you can see, that was lovely. As her designer said, as lovely as anything on Fifth Avenue. Wow. This is the beauty school downstairs in that building. And then this is the mansion that Madam Walker built in Irvington, New York, still standing, a National Historic Landmark, and now owned by a foundation that was created by Richard Lou Dennis. This is the music room. And then Alelia Walker here on the left, uh, after Madam Walker died, this is the Walker team of executives, and Alelia Walker at the piano in the music room at Villa Laurel. The 1924 Walker Agents Convention, this is five years after Madam Walker died, but you can see how proud these wow. women are to be there at the, at the house. And then this is the line of products that, um, the MCJW line of products at Sephora. And I will, somebody mentioned, I think Tony mentioned that I got my start by giving myself a start. So I will end <laughs> with these words. Madam Walker said that people often ask her the secret to her success. And she would say to them, there is no royal flower strewn path to success. And if there is, I have not found it. For whatever success I have attained has been the result of much hard work and many sleepless nights. I got my start by giving myself a start. So don't sit down and wait for the opportunities to come. You have to get up and make them for yourself. Aluya Bundles, thank you very, very much. And thank you for joining us on your day off. Thank you.
Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends. Give us a rating and drop a review. To listen to all the latest podcasts, please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet. And to stay connected on and off the show, you can follow us at Hair Street on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Peace and love.